So, um, some interesting topics in this chapter. I hope you uh, assigned the yes. reading. Uh, hopefully you guys had a chance to sneak that in at some point uh, through your spring break festivities and relaxation, and now you're all prepared to digest some new stuff. So, um, got some interesting topics of, of uh, how um, cities um, separate themselves into different demographic categories <clears throat> and how much of that goes on. So we start off, I like to start off looking at the data um, just to see what goes on. You know, we know that uh, uh, segregation laws have been passed back in the, in the 60s, right? So all of that stuff is illegal. And so now what we're looking at is are there natural market forces that people are, are choosing? Are there external circumstances? You know, a lot of interesting topics that both economists and sociologists look at. So here's an income segregation in Boston. So we've got the dark being the richer people. So tending to be near each other. It's a pretty wide range. Yep. Yeah, that is a wide range. We've got educational attainment, college degrees per thousand people. So how densely populated are the college degrees? All right, so the darker areas again are the college degree. So if everything, if that wasn't an issue, then the shading would be the same across the whole city, right? So we're seeing people kind of uh, sort themselves into uh, areas with respect to education. Here's some crime costs. I like these three-dimensional ones. So they pop out where it's higher is the, this was annual cost per victim. The economist did some estimates of what a crime costs to just put a price tag on this type of crime. Ends up on average impacting somebody with this level of, of amount of monetary damage just to kind of estimate it. And then this shows you where within the city those crimes are being, are taking place. And that's in Cleveland. So here's cost of crime in Boston. And so we don't see this even distribution throughout. Well, so would it take you data to do something like that? I mean, like seriously. Well, a lot of it's there. So when, when you get into doing research projects, depending on what your thesis question is, um, some of it might be just sitting there in a, in a spreadsheet that somebody gathered from some survey that was done back in the 90s. And so they happen to collect the right amount of data. Certainly income, educational attainment, you know, there's a lot of random samples that gather that type of information. And so um, I think it's gotten even easier over the years because of our data storage abilities. Like even when I wrote my dissertation way back when, uh, when did I, I actually started it in uh, the late 90s, um, I had to call another professor that did some research up in Michigan to see if they would share the data set. And you know, they had to actually send a file to me that had that type of data on it. And then I'm just harvesting the data that, I, that was applicable to my particular project. So that's kind of how that works. It's a lot. So with the, our data storage cap uh, capabilities and email and all that, that's allowed that data to be uh, transferred a lot quicker now. So Atlanta, racial segregation. So again, kind of similar to the education per thousand, uh, blacks per thousand <coughs> over the whole Atlanta area. <coughs> And here's Pittsburgh. These ribbons are the, are the highways uh, cutting through. <clears throat> OK, so what causes <clears throat> um, uh, municipalities to become more and more homogeneous or integrated, whether it's integrated with education, income, race, what, what are the kind of underlying fundamentals that might impact that? So we're going to start off with uh, voting, uh, a small little voting model that kind of shows how things get determined 
uh, in our municipality. So we got a, a city with just three voters, differing demands, that's their willingness to pay, like we've used in previous models. Uh, the cost of parks are $60 per acre, shared equally by the citizens with a head tax. So on a per person basis, kind of a flat tax spread out evenly is the assumption of this model. And then we'll, we'll do a little variance on that later. And then we're playing with uh, majority rules. <clears throat> so you can imagine we've got different demands for the size of the park. So here we've got uh, Lois, Marion, and Hiram. And each one might have their individual marginal benefit curve. And what's unique about this variable, park, as opposed to beer and pizza? And what's unique about this consumption variable? OK, so we got the non-excludable. Part, so it might be hard to exclude people or cost prohibitive to exclude people. And then there's one other element that's probably it's relevant. Land. It's like a, it's a lot larger than, it's not rival. It's non rival. So that's the other fancy econ term. So we've got non excludability and non rivalry were the conditions for a public good. And so this is probably as good a time as any to, to jog your memories that. A public good sometimes is referred to, oh, it's because the government paid for it. But in economics class, a public good has certain characteristics of non-excludability and non-rivalry. So non-rivalry is what? One person enjoying it or they, someone else enjoy it less. Yeah, so multiple people can enjoy it at the same time. We can all be in the park together at the same time, and my enjoying the park, myself consuming the park doesn't take away from your enjoyment of the park. And then what was the non-excludability factor? Chelsea, since you brought it up. Non-excludability. Um, I guess I kind of said it, didn't I? Right. But that's all right. Why don't you rehash it? <laughs> I mean, you can't keep people out. Yeah, it's hard to keep people out. Non-payers, specifically. So we, it brings up the other <coughs> issue we have in economics of the free rider problem. So if you have a good where you're kind of expecting, well, why don't you just pay whatever feels good? You know, what, what's it worth to you? Why don't you just donate that and use the park? Well, what we find is that people tend to free ride, right? They don't reveal their true benefit of it. So if, if uh, this person gets $28 worth of benefit and we have them give a voluntary donation, they might say, tend to say, ah, it's worth about 10 bucks to me, right? They're not gonna reveal their willingness to pay. And so if, the good is non-excludable and non-rival, um, the non-excludability part causes problems for a business to offer it. Because in order for a business to be in business, they need to turn a buck, and they need to be able to exclude users from getting it, right? So that's the non-excludability. So private goods like cheeseburgers and pizza and all the stuff we've talked about as these, in these cities, those are excludable and rival, so one person enjoys it, and it's gone, um, and you, the McDonald's keeps you from getting the, the hamburger with their counter and their payment system. All right, <clears throat> now, as long as I'm on the topic here, there's some other goods that <clears throat> can be uh, non-rival and excludable. So the movie theater is excludable, right? but it's non-rival up to a certain point. We can have 60 or 100 people in the theater at once enjoying the movie simultaneously. So the excludability um, uh, characteristic ends up being the key one to whether a private business without any government influence um, can make it run efficiently, is excludability ends up being the, probably the more important one. And, and that's why uh, that video that we watched on uh, not the last time, but a couple times ago with the, with the traffic and the tollways, we start to think that the government has to put the roads down, but really, roads are excludable, which opens the door for a private company to build their own road, and you can't get on the road and use it unless you pay, right? So it's an excludable road, even though it's non-rival, up to a certain point of congestion, as what was part of the problem, right? So 
a certain amount of people can drive at the speed limit, no problem. We can put 100 cars, 300 cars, whatever that magic number is, until there becomes too many that there's congestion, and then we start to have um, some issues. Okay, so this is our classic public good problem here. Um, with six acres, Lois gets $20 worth of benefit. Um, Marion, Marion, yes, Marion gets $28, and Hiram gets $48 worth of benefit. Okay, questions or comments on that? <clears throat> so, with a tax of $20 per person, if we just go out and tax people at 20, does each person get his or her desired quantity? No, just kind of reinforcing the fact that in a market system, if we can charge $20 per use, then Hiram would buy 28 acres today, right? That would be their benefit, but that's not the way it works since we've got this, uh, this non-rival, uh, non-excludable good. All right, but that shows their preferences at 20. <clears throat> so, how big of a park do we get if we use majority rule? What are we going to get for the park? So we got a six acre park, a 12 acre park, or a 28 acre park is on the agenda for a $20 tax because Hiram says, well, for 20 bucks, I want 28 acres. For 20 bucks, I want six. For 20 bucks, I want 12. Well, I guess we can't agree on everything, so let's go to the voting booth and decide which one we're going to do. And so if we do a little comparison of possible votes, let me start with one that's not here. If it's, are we, should we do a six acre or a 28 acre? Who decides which one we're doing? If, we're gonna, if the possibilities are a six acre or a 28, the small or the big, who's the deciding vote? Miriam is, right? Because she's the one in the middle, and we already know who's in each camp of the big one is Hiram, the little one is Lois, and so she ends up being the deciding vote. Now if we go, well, what about six versus 12? Well, we already know she's in there, and since it's smaller, uh, we're going to have everybody but uh, Lois in a in a, a 6 versus 12, a 28 versus 12, and so it's always the median voter that drives the result. That's the median voters, very similar to the, the uh, principle of median location. All right, so that's a little bit on median voter, and we have a majority rule. <clears throat> Okay, so, give that a read. The idea here is, what's gonna happen over time? So we're kind of starting at, here's a situation, what's this thing gonna look like in a dynamic environment of maybe there's additional people coming in or there's people types of, I'm a small park type, I'm a big park type, I'm a medium park type. <clears throat> what's this idea of voting with your feet? They move and they sort themselves into that, right? So if there's going to be a different cost associated with, with each size park, we're gonna to start to see people move into, or creating their own uh, Lois, the city or community of Lois, the Marion, the Hirams, they're gonna to start to kind of group together just from, from that uh, standpoint alone because somebody's always unhappy given what we looked at before. Somebody's always uh, getting shorted. Let's put a little twist into it. Suppose we come up with a way to tax different people different amounts. So instead of the flat tax, people with big heads get taxed more than people with small heads. 
And so your textbook kind of takes this down, this big head, small head, and I think it's kind of confusing until they get to the punchline. I think they're kind of trying to be funny. So I want to kind of give it to you up front of where, the, where they're going. The heads are like houses. And so um, if you have a big house, property taxes are, are according to value almost anywhere you go in the United States. So if you buy a $200,000 house, you're going to end up paying more because let's say the tax rate is 3%. You're going to pay 3% on $200,000, whereas if you live in a small house, you're going to, a $100,000 house, you're going to pay 3% on $100,000. And so it's not on a per head basis, it's an ad valerum tax. Ad valerum is a fancy Latin word that means according to value. Ad valerum, according to value. And so here, with the, the model we're going to look at is, is what if we are according to weight? <clears throat> So, $10 per pound, two pounds for pin, Abner's 10, Gordo is 24 pounds. That's our big head, Gordo. Now the park, we're gonna assume, still stays, comes in at 360, because we're still following the median voter uh, idea, and the median person drives the result, and we end up getting that same park, the six acre park at, six, at 60 uh, per acre. But now as a little flip here, if we live in a, in a mixed municipality with all types of head sizes, we can come up with a funding mechanism for the 360 by taxing a certain amount per pound. So <clears throat> this is uh, uh, almost exactly how, uh, and I don't think the details of the text quite bring it out, but um, how municipalities work their tax and how states tax. You take your tax base, so they come up with an assessed value for your property. And in this case, we're using the weights. So you've got, Gordo owns a $24,000 piece and Abner uh, is the 10,000 and, and Penn's got the $2,000 value. And so the assessed value of property in the community is 24 plus 10 is 34, 36 pounds worth of value overall. And now I can say, I need 360 bucks to pay for a park. And so now I can set the tax rate according to the value by saying it needs to be 2%, it needs to be 3%. I just do a simple little math equation that says, I need to raise $360, I've got 36 pounds worth of value, and we just figure out what the rate needs to be. That rate for this little problem turned out to be $10 per pound. And so Pin's gonna pay 20 bucks, Abner's gonna pay 100 bucks, and Gordo's gonna pay 240. All right, so what's the rest of this looking like? What incentives are out there for um, movement, voting with your feet? What are the rest of these numbers here? Exclusive small head, exclusive average, exclusive big. Does it always give an incentive? You know, I was gonna say, it seems like they're like, well, if you move up, you're having less taxes per pound. Okay. But it, and why? I guess what's, yeah, you're, you're on the right track here. What, what's, um, what's driving that? They're trying to divide the cost equally between the yes. size. Yeah, so we're still got kind of the same problem at hand, right? I've got a $360 uh, park that I'm trying to fund. If I have a bunch of Gordos in my community, if I've got three Gordos in my community, now I've got more value to spread that $360 evenly over those people, which effectively drops Gordos tax. And so now we're, we've given Gordo incentive to find other big heads to join him in their little community, okay? And so you guys see this, right? I mean, you go to almost any community. Ottawa's a little bit of an exception, but there's, there's some sorting of that, because sometimes in Ottawa we see big houses next to smaller and you know, kind of a, a more uh, sprinkled, but you go to Overland Park and Olathe and other suburbs, and it's pretty clear you've got the the home with the $300,000 houses, or the subdivision with the 300s, the 500s, the 150s, right? it's, it's very similar to that. 
<clears throat> okay. So, any questions on that? I should have said before I clicked. All right, so the point with this whole exercise is to think about how many different communities we might start to see going. And with the, with the lowest types and the, the Merriam types and the Hiram types, and then we add within each type the possibility of there being small heads and big heads according to value, we end up having potentially nine different communities. And we start to see something that reflects what we saw in those maps of people starting to filter into different geographic areas. All right, questions or comments there? <clears throat> okay, so one of our axioms talked about externalities. What was that from test number one? Who remembers the externalities? Externalities cause inefficiency. Cause inefficiency. Ah, that's somewhat cheating, man. So. All right, so externalities cause inefficiency. Graphically, what does that look like when we use supply and demand curves? Moving some costs up. Okay. So possibly moving some costs up. Yeah, what is that, what is that allocative efficiency business about? So let's go good old-fashioned free market economics, supply equals demand, we get this many units being produced. Boom, we enter an externality. What's the story? So we could use cost or we could use, we can go another direction too. They, they can be positive or they can be negative. So what, what goes on here? Good, yeah, so a divergence of social benefits versus private benefits. So when we do a nice little thing like this, without any externalities, what's the underlying assumption in terms of social benefits and social costs? Uh, they're equal at equilibrium. But that is allocative efficiency. It's allocative efficiency, so I'm drilling down a little bit deeper. Okay, so without any externalities, what is this demand curve assumed to be? The social, the social benefit curve, as well as the private benefit curve. In other words, all of the benefits to society are embodied in the private person's demand that's actually consuming this good. So if it's pizza, great. The benefits of that pizza out in the marketplace are reflected in the people who are eating the pizza. There's nobody else. That's it. So private benefits equal social benefits. On the supply curve, <clears throat> without any externalities, the supply reflects society's cost at the margin. All of the cost of making pizza all of society's cost of making pizza are embodied in the cost of this pizza village place making pizza. There's no other problems, right? So then we start to get into externalities, which are a divergence between private costs and social costs. And so when there's an externality, <clears throat> what goes on? How do we reflect that graphically? A shift, Colby, what'd you say? Okay, could be demand, could be supply. So if we shift it this way, I, it looked like you were pointing this direction, but either way is fine. If the marginal social benefit is now MB1 instead of MB, let's call it MB2 instead of MB1, 
or NSB1, then is the market underproducing or overproducing? Under. Under, right? So society's allocatively efficient quantity is always where the market here is because now this is no longer the social benefit. The private sector is producing this much pizza when really it should be out here ideally if all of the benefits, uh, I'm not sure what this pizza example, where this is going, but apparently pizza makes people help other people out. They all of a sudden become more charitable if, if they eat pizza, right? Or something, there's somehow there's societal benefits that Remember, externalities deal with third parties that are outside the transaction. That's how we get the externality that aren't included with this. So somehow they're serving society better and just being good citizens or whatever. And so we'd like to see more pizza consumption. How can we get that pizza consumption going? All right, so that's kind of helpful now as we think about externalities because at, at, a, at a very local level, we have externalities going on right in our community, right with our neighbors, right? Who's living next to you? What do they do day in and day out, right? How about your kids interacting with the neighbor kids? What do they do when they're not in front of mom and dad? That all of a sudden becomes pretty important possibly, right? So we're thinking about those externalities that are within the neighborhood or those people close to you. Okay, <clears throat> how do we get this sorting going on? What are, what are some reasons that, it, that we end up having more integrated neighborhoods or more segregated neighborhoods? <clears throat> so this is the model we're gonna look at. Two neighborhoods, neighborhood A and neighborhood B. All right, and there's gonna be some differences. We've got 100 lots in each, two income groups. We've got high income people and low income uh, people, uh, and each with 100 households. The only difference between the neighborhoods is the income mix. So each neighborhood has high and low? Yes, <laughs> yep. and then we're gonna think about what the mix of the neighborhood is and how it changes. <clears throat> So as we go through this, we're gonna go through these three figures. Think about what we're starting with and where we're going. So we're gonna start with an integrated neighborhood, 50-50, right? So we got high income people, low income people, and then what happens as we think about different situations? <clears throat> so this model highlights a premium, kind of a willingness <coughs> to pay for being in a certain place. This variable is important to kind of get you, wrap your noggin around. We've got high income households in neighborhood A. So as we move this direction along the horizontal axis, are we getting more segregated or less? More, and more. more segregated, right? So we're getting more and more high income people. All right. What's driving that? Well, I want to think about a, uh, a rent gap on what you're willing to pay to live in that neighborhood and how much people are willing to pay uh, to be there. And so these premiums are, in, in essence, at an individual level, capturing those externalities. We're kind of, in a sense, internalizing the externality because you're willing to bid up property up to the value that you place on having your little kids playing with those little kids, right? So it no longer, in a sense, becomes an externality in its pure form uh, in that we're able to possibly pay with our feet and our movement to a different location, we're able to pay to get that externality. You know what I mean? So um, if we start here at at point, uh, or at 55, what is our predicted movement? So what's going on with this curve being uh, above this curve? So notice, first of all, 
both low-income and high-income people want to live in that neighborhood, right? Both low-income people and high-income people are willing to pay a little bit more to be in that neighborhood. This reflects their willingness to pay or reflects that premium is what this function is doing. Well, if they can pay. Yes, that too. Yeah. So if we're here, why would we start to possibly move up? What's the story? The positive externality. Isn't it positive externality that's always prevalent and increasing in the high income neighborhood? Uh, yes. So. so Um, yes, there's always a desire to, to, to kind of get there. And the income increases in the, in the high income households, the externalities jump at an increasing rate, like they pick up more externalities. We're holding more. their income actually constant. So we're just kind of got these two groups, high income, low income. So we're kind of just saying they fall into this range, kind of like we did with that one graph. So I don't want to, we're not measuring the variable income here. We're holding income constant and we've lumped people into you're a, Rich, poor, whatever you want to call them. So we kind of got these just two categories. John? The neighborhoods are becoming more segregated. And as, as they become more segregated, there's more and more incentive to try to get into the high neighborhood. OK. Everybody. Yeah, everybody wants to get in. And so what's the issue with this curve being above this curve? What's the story? The high income people have the ability. They have the ability to do it, right? They have the ability to outbid them. Okay. So as we look at this, if the high income people have a higher premium, which is relative to their externality. Notice the shape of this curve too. We got a concave looking curve going up, meaning what? It's, gonna flatten. it's flattening out. So as we get into a more and more high income neighborhood, the incremental amount of premium that I'm willing to pay to have it a little bit more high income is less and less, right? So that premium, the value of the premium is increasing at a diminishing rate, increasing at a decreasing rate. All right, well, under this set of circumstances, S ends up being our equilibrium, where we just have two neighborhoods. Neighborhood A has all high income, neighborhood B has all low income. So it ends up being based off of what they can pay. Right. Yeah. Now there's three different now we're analyzing three different cases. This is kind of the first one that kind of okay. resonates. But <clears throat> it's possible maybe that we could have the low income premium curve above the high income premium curve. Which I know sounds a little bit weird at first to think, well they got more money, they can always outbid them. But you've got other things to do with your money too, right? You can buy a Rolls Royce. You can go to the Bahamas every other week. Uh, you can do a lot of things. So don't forget that, that we're isolating it into the neighborhood that you got. And that's going to be dependent to, on, on the impact those externalities have on you, which might be different. So this is not like some weird case that would never happen. This is a possibility. Yeah. What necessarily all affects the slope of the and, and so I, I think the underlying answer to that is this unmodeled externality of whether it's a big deal or a small deal. At the margin, it's possible that the value of having it move this direction is higher for low income people. And they're willing to sacrifice their smaller budget because they are lower income, but they're willing to put a larger fraction of their budget into housing to get to that good situation. Does that help a little bit? So it's something that's not, what we're really doing with these three cases is just modeling the possibilities. Like, could it be up here? Could it be up here? If it's up here, then we have this thing gravitating towards the integrated equilibrium. And we get just the opposite result. Instead of segregation, we get integration. What flip-flops the curves, though? What allows the low-income curve to be on top and vice versa? I think, like, like the low-income people, the house, the, like, the housing is a higher priority for them, so they, like, really, really want to live there. So it's based on value? Well, like, well, totally. like the high-income people, the 
living in that neighborhood is like, I don't know, it'd be really nice, but we also want to have a million dollar car cool. and a big pool in our backyard. Okay. You can even think about different cultures. Let's take Kansas versus California. You know, maybe in Kansas, our culture is such that we don't really care about keeping up with the Joneses as much, right? It, it's not that big of a deal for me to be, you know, one-upping my neighbor all the time or whatever. So that type of thing is the impact of that particular variable, location, and all the things that go into that location, they might not all be rosy. And they might not be at the margin that valuable to you. And maybe another good example would be um, <clears throat> dependent upon the size of the household. So do you have a lot of kids or are you kidless? says if you want to be in a neighborhood with other kids, and that's an important variable, is how little Tommy and Johnny play together when mom and dad aren't around after school, then how important is that variable to you? So this is just based on, on the model. It could, like based on what the model is suggesting, that the low income could value housing more yep. than high income. That's it's a theoretical possibility. So it could happen in any yep. certain Could case. happen so depending on what the circumstances is. Right now we're just trying to develop a model right that explains why we might, through natural market forces, move towards integration or move towards segregation. So we're just talking literally about whether people are okay with being in a community of people of different social stratification. With the integration, yes. And we're only picking on... Well, whether or not, I mean, <clears throat> even in the last one, it's like they're not okay, but this one they are. Yes, yes, and it's a blending of, of multiple things because we are, um, you know, we are picking on one particular variable at this snapshot, and as we saw, it could be education, income, race, you know, other demographic variables, the kids um, playing with each other, whatever generates those externalities and whatever they are. Can you explain how it's self-correcting again, just because <coughs> I'll move out farther based on those worse off or something? For this here? Yeah. So right now we've got, um, uh, if we start here at our starting place of integration, then uh, high income people aren't willing to pay uh, to get into that neighborhood as much as low income people. Uh -huh. And so it's stable. This equilibrium uh -huh. is stable. If we think about starting it's there, yeah. Okay. Yep. And Furthermore, if we're, if we're out here somewhere, then low-income people are willing to pay to get into that neighborhood, which then starts to drift us this way. And so it moves us towards that point. Okay, got one more. What about a little crisscross? So at this point, there's some mix in the middle <clears throat> where we've got the high-income people with a curvature like this, and low income coming up. So we always tend to gravitate to where the lines cross. Do we end up towards a segregated outcome or a integrated outcome? So we end up being mixed. So we kind of are just taking our two pictures that we had before, right? If low is above here, then we're going to move this direction. And if high is above here, we head this direction. Now, if we flip-flop these two crisscrosses, we end up with the other one. Technically, with the last one, right? mixed as well. Yeah. It would have been integrated fully. Yeah. Right, right. Integrated. Fully, yeah. So that, that no, that's a good point. This extreme in, in output is that fully integrated. So if we look at one of those maps that we started off with, the shading would be equal all the way across. Right? So it's kind of that theoretical endpoint of, of what does it look like to be fully integrated, like there doesn't seem to be any sort of sorting, any sort of segregation. How are they driving the rent gap again? Um, just the willingness to pay to be in that area. And this is, this is uh, area A versus area B. So that's the gap. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to be in this neighborhood or this neighborhood, yes. And so it's showing my willingness to be in in the uh, high income neighborhood. So yeah, one of the assumptions is that the the high income neighborhood is the the better one to be in. <coughs> okay, uh, so this just kind of explains that. Skip 
Uh, um, I think that's a good place to to stop this, but not uh, not this. <clears throat> I've got a problem, or I thought I did. Maybe we will be stopping. Handouts to look over that are apparently. I will improvise. Um, we'll we'll pick up from here, but let's let's get our juices flowing. Just did. So we got a city of 200 people. Are you doing this? Uh, just pull out a piece of, yeah, just a regular piece of paper. Just to, well, first of all, let's kind of work through it. And then we're going to draw some premium curves. So we got a city of 200 people, 100 aged, 100 young. So not high income, low income, but kind of similar concept. Uh, 100 people each. People generally prefer to live close to aged people. We don't know why, or it's just assumptions of the model, okay? So to draw the rent premium curves, put the number of aged people in the neighborhood, uh, A, from 50 to 100, just like we just went through, on the horizontal axis. Uh, the premium curve for aged people is concave from below, so it's got that curvy thing going. And in a neighborhood of 100 aged people, the premium is 30. So if you've got all, if you're at that end point of 100, those old people are, willing to pay 30. The premium, yeah, so it's a little bit of a twist here. So the premium curve for the young people is linear and in a neighborhood of 100 aged people. <clears throat> the two premium curves intersect at age 70 with the rent premium 20. So draw the two premium curves. Yes, yep, same graph. They'll, so they're kind of try to do your axes a little bit, you know, just kind of make some hash marks. 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Yes, yeah. That's why if you put those little hash, actually, if you start with the crisscross point, that's probably start with where they're intersecting. That's probably a little bit easier to do. So they intersect at the 70 point. Down here. Yeah, if you draw the 70, even before you draw your curves. Uh, you, you'll be okay. Just kind of draw that 70. That's where they're intersecting. Even though the linear curve ends at a premium. Right. So they're kind of trying to give you the, the shape of how bowed out it is. I love how they don't say old. They just say age. Aged, yes. That helps people like me feel better about life. <laughs> yes, yes, it was completely drawn by that. How old is the guy that Uh Well, it, like, I used it when I was 20, so 
something. Right. So, so he's, he's a fine I saw a picture. Yeah, he's maybe, a fine line. Maybe it said it older back then. Yeah, I don't know if he was 40. I'm sure he's probably in the 60 range would be my guess. All right, so what about integration? It looks like most of you got that going. Let's start thinking about those two curves. So integration occurs at 50-50. That's at the left side, right, of the horizontal axis. We've got integration. Is or isn't a stable equilibrium? Isn't. Why do you say that? There's a... Okay, so and who's got who's got the higher willingness to pay? The aged. The aged. So we end up having a self-reinforcing effect, right? Where we're going to start having more uh, that direction. All right, we'll pick up there on Thursday. I will be sending out. Um,